The press called him Indiana Jones, a daring tomb raider who looted ancient artifacts from Egypt. He obviously recognized that there was a potential to make a huge income from smuggling these antiquities into the West and selling them. His accomplices idolized him as a master of deception. The idea behind the smuggling operation is a fantastic, very, very clever idea. It's brilliant. He was a top player in a dangerous game. I was immensely proud of what I was doing. It's a game which requires wit and skill and very good nerves. For 10 years, he eluded authorities on two continents and made millions. Find out how he did it next on Masterminds. Beneath the sands of Egypt lie the remains of 5,000 years of human history. In the early 90s, there was an upsurge in the smuggling of these ancient artifacts. Property was being excavated from the ground and then suddenly turning up in the West and being sold for huge profits. In an effort to protect their priceless cultural heritage, Egyptian authorities cracked down. Security was dramatically increased. The risks are considerable. Egyptian prisons are not a place that you want to spend a great deal of time in. But in London, the center of the illegal antiquities trade, British authorities noticed a flood of illicit goods still coming onto the market. Various people across the Western world were prepared to pay bigger and bigger money. Presuming that you have the expertise, you can make millions of pounds per year. Police feared someone had found a way to beat the system. He was manipulating the whole system for financial gain. He exploits the antiquity market, but he exploits it brilliantly. Then in 1993, a 3,000-year-old sculpture of an ancient pharaoh, Amenhotep III, came onto the London market. It was an extremely significant piece. It was a very rare piece. At the height of the Gulf War, with security at an all-time high, a master smuggler had found a way to do the impossible. If I had been caught at that time, they'd have killed me. His most brilliant move was being able to transport out of Egypt without raising any questions. To get the peace out of the country, he took the shadowy art of smuggling to a level law enforcement had never seen before. Back in England, the statue was transformed from contraband into a legitimate collector's piece and sold for over a million dollars. He was a mastermind of smuggling antiquities from Egypt. A lot of the newspapers over here saw me as a sort of Indiana Jones. I saw myself as something very old-fashioned and very traditional, doing something that the English do well, smuggling with calm nerves and moral courage and a sense of fun, sense of humor. Jonathan Tokley Perry was a dashing romantic figure and one of the most ingenious smugglers of the 20th century. The question is, how did he do it? <laughs> Jonathan Tokley Perry is one of the 20th century's greatest antiquity smugglers, eluding massive security to escape from Egypt with a million dollar sculpture. But this mastermind with nerves of steel didn't start out like Indiana Jones. Born into a middle class family, Tokley Perry is accepted into prestigious Cambridge University. He develops an interest in art and antiquities and reinvents himself as an upper-class gentleman. My family wanted me to get on a train and go into the city and make a lot of money and have a heart attack when I was 50. And I point-blank refused. He's a complex character. He has a, almost a heightened sense of honor. He wanted to go into the army, but was turned down. He then joined the Territorial Army, 
sort of weekend soldiers, part-timers. Denied the opportunity to pursue a full-time military career, Tokley Perry returns to his first love, the past. Just touching something ancient was a wonderful feeling. You catch a vibration, and I knew that that was what I wanted to do. After training as an antiquities restorer, he quickly gains an international reputation. I was the highest paid restorer in England, probably Europe, but I still could not afford to buy any of these wonderful objects. I would have the most stunning things on my table that I restored and brought back to life, and then I'd have to give them back. And I realized that a restorer is just a servant. What Togli Perry wants is to be his own master. He was restoring objects for dealers who were selling them for thousands or even hundreds of thousands of pounds. And I think his head was turned. He obviously recognized that there was a potential to make a huge income from smuggling these antiquities into the West and selling them. Egypt is the place if you have a passion for antiquities. 3,000 years of continuous civilization, an enormous number of objects and buildings, and the feeling that at any time something wonderful is going to turn up. Tokli Perry travels to Cairo under the guise of a researcher. There, he makes contact with a local smuggler. He befriended a chap called Ali Farag, who was the youngest of, of a large family, all of whom were engaged in uh, smuggling antiquities out of Egypt. Ali Farag tells Tokli Perry about an artifact that has been found at a construction site. But the Gulf War is raging, and Tokli Perry must proceed with extreme caution. The country was under full military alert. Foreigners were being arrested if they were seen with Egyptians. I was actually hiding in the boot of the car because there were roadblocks everywhere. Went out to the southern suburbs of Cairo. A building contractor with connections to the smuggling underworld has unearthed an ancient artifact. I was just thinking, is it genuine? Is it authentic? So I made myself work very, very carefully, look at it, check the patina, check the stone, check the style. Tokli Perry realizes he's looking at a 3,000-year-old sculpture that will make him a very rich man. The significance of the head is that Amenhotep III, the sun god, is a particularly uh, significant pharaoh. But Jonathan has to keep his cool. The Egyptians are the best salesmen in the world. They are psychologically so brilliant. The high-stakes game begins. He was looking at me, and I met his eyes and looked away. The last thing I'm going to do is let this one go, because I've been waiting for five years for this. Tokli Perry is desperate, but so is the contractor. Jonathan calls his bluff. The Egyptians were panicking. They were desperate for currency. Now the master dealmaker drives a very hard bargain. $6,000 cash for a million-dollar piece of history. I had my first world-class piece. There wasn't any period of, of feeling, oh, the world is wonderful, God's on my side. All I realized was, oh, Christ, how am I going to get this out? Because being caught with the piece could be fatal, he must think fast. His most brilliant move, and the move that no one else had identified, was the actual disguising of the piece. And that meant preparing it, which was to make the object look as much as possible like a kitsch, bizarre thing, the sort that idiots buy in the hotel shops all the time. To do this, I had to take a battered antiquity and make it look like a modern, complete object. So I had to build up, make up the things which were missing. He coats the statue with a gum and applies gold leaf. He polishes the leaf, then paints the sculpture so it looks like a cheap souvenir. He then buys a real souvenir, keeps the receipt, removes the base, 
and places the sculpture on it. Having done that, the object looked absolutely ghastly, but it gave us a good chance of getting through. Security was double. There were armed soldiers everywhere. In fact, it was just complete bloody madness for me to do it. And the consequences of getting it wrong would be really, really nasty. I would have been taken to the desert and not come back. At the airport, security is everywhere. Tokley Perry is stopped by the antiquities police. Made me open the suitcase. And he said, what is this? I said, oh, it's a present. Here's the receipt. And I tried to distract him by holding the receipt. And then the bit I dreaded. He reached into his pocket and he brought out his bloody keys. Now, Egyptians are very good with keys. They get a key and they scratch the surface. And I knew that if he scratched on the face, he would go straight through to the stone and I'd be buggered. And as he went to, to scratch, I said, no, no, not there, underneath, much better. I had to get him down to the base where I'd prepared an extra inch of plaster just for him to scratch. And he saw the plaster, looked at it, and waved his hand and wandered off. And thank God I got it right. Back in England, he sails through customs. But his work is far from complete. First, he must remove the elaborate disguise without damaging the sculpture. Breaking the gilding in plaster is far too risky. But his expert knowledge of chemistry pays off. Before he covered the statue in plaster, he coated it with a protective layer of plastic. I put it into a bath of acetone and gradually, gently, everything will float off, leaving the antiquity exactly as I received it in Egypt. He then took it to the next stage where he actually changed the eye line, he changed, the, he added part of the beard to it. In his own words, give it a better line so that the collectors would pay more money for it. But if buyers suspect the piece is stolen, they'll alert police. So he now forges documents to give the statue a convincing history. To make the labels, I took some Victorian pharmacy labels, cut out the letters, rearranged them, had them printed on a very old stock of paper, and then practiced my copper plate 20s handwriting with the ink which I'd chemically faded. And then having cut out the label, I aged it, I soaked it in tea, I dried it, I wet it, I dried it again. So I had a label that looked thoroughly scratched and ancient. He glues the label to the back of the sculpture. It would appear that the object hadn't come from Egypt at all, had come from an old country collection in England. Tokley Perry is now ready to strike. Through his network of international antiquities dealers, he sells the sculpture for a million dollars. I couldn't believe it. It seemed that I'd actually uh, achieved what I wanted in, 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 in one hit. But this success is just the beginning, and Tokley Perry's ambition to be the world's greatest antiquities smuggler will soon threaten to bring him down. Jonathan Tokley Perry has made a million dollars smuggling the sculpture of Amenhotep III. Over the next four years, he continues to secretly export Egyptian antiquities and reaps a fortune. Jonathan indulged himself with his lifestyle. Um, he had several suits made by his um, Devon tailor. He bought an extremely expensive sports car. I made millions of pounds which was nice. It's nice to be paid for what you love doing. As soon as the money got bigger, the objects got bigger, and the whole game became more dangerous and more sophisticated, he realized that he needed a mule to carry these pieces out. I had so much stuff in Egypt to carry out, and so little time, that I thought to employ somebody else to carry it for me. Jonathan targets Mark Perry, a local handyman. Jonathan Perry walked in and I was sort of awestruck by him. 
I think he saw I was gullible in the first place. He, he knew that, you know, here's a lad, a young lad, young family, very short of money. Tokley Perry offers Mark 500 pounds a week, plus all the adventure he can handle. Somebody comes along to me and says, you're going over to Egypt, you're going to stay in a hotel, all expenses paid, and I'm going to pay you for it. But I had the chance of adventure, I had the chance of money, and getting away from the day-to-day -day realities of life. I, I, I could actually do something. Tokley Perry soon introduces his protege to Egypt's smuggling underworld. We arrived in Cairo, and nothing prepared me for what I was about to, to feel that day. Just amazing to see. And of course, again, I was awestruck by it all. I showed Mark what I was doing. He even trained him in how to camouflage the objects. And then Mark would bring them back to this country. And I took him through customs once to show him the techniques. And I instructed him very, very carefully what to do if there was any problem. I did all the dirty donkey work. It was my life on the line. I've carried half a million pounds worth of antiquity in a bag through the center of Cairo and not even thought anything of it didn't even realize what I had. All I was wanting to do was get back for a beer in the bar. With his mule in place, Tokli Perry now hires a more sophisticated partner to help negotiate with the Egyptians. He makes a deal with Andrew May, an aristocrat fallen on hard times. We had a gentleman's understanding that he would only take the smaller pieces that were no longer of any concern to me and that he would train himself in the market and eventually, maybe in a decade's time, he would take over from me. But Andrew May soon turns out to be a problem. The mistake he made with Andrew May was that, having gone to Egypt and seen the huge amounts of money that could be made, and Andrew May began buying pieces and bringing them out, as well as bringing out Jonathan's pieces. He was too greedy and too hungry and too frightened, and he tried, putting it very simply, to rip me off. The big difference between Jonathan and Andrew was that Jonathan had worked with antiquities for many, many years as a restorer. Jonathan had done his homework. Andrew, in the space of months, tried to pull off the same act and lacked the knowledge. In Cairo, May buys a collection of rare ancient Egyptian documents known as papyrus. But fearing the artifacts are fake, he takes them to the British Museum to be authenticated. It was one of the most stupid things that you could possibly have done. Museum archaeologists quickly realize these are artifacts that they had originally discovered and that had been stolen in Egypt. They contact police. When we were contacted by the British Museum, formed an opinion immediately that it was such a dumb thing to have done that this person couldn't possibly be responsible for the theft and the looting of this material. When we started to research Andrew May, we found that he was the owner of a manor house in Devon. One of his tenants was Jonathan Tokley Parry, somebody who had a large collection of Egyptian material and was working as a restorer. While Tokley Parry's landlord is now under investigation, his courier, Mark Perry, is also attracting the attention of the police. We received some information about a guy who had, on a regular basis, was, was depositing large sums of money into a bank account. We initially thought it was a drugs-type inquiry. We identified him as a man called Mark Perry. We made some inquiries and we established that Mark was going to Egypt. Not a normal route for drugs. And uh, that's as far as we got, really, uh, until we received a telephone call from the Scotland Yard Art and Antique Squad. Dick Ellis made some inquiries about stolen artifacts. The authorities close in on Tokley Perry from all directions. We swore out three search warrants from the courts in London to search premises at the Manor House itself. No one was home. He isn't there. They have to break in. We found Jonathan Tokley Perry's workshop. And it was in the workshop that we found a vast amount of antiquities. So it was fortuitous, or perhaps unfortuitous for Jonathan, that he turned up while we were in his house. 
When I got to my front door, I could see that my kitchen window had been smashed. And there was a grey, stout man there. And I said to him, have I been burgled? What's happening? And he said, we're the police. And I said, oh, thank God you're here. And he said, well, actually, we did that. And we're here to arrest you. And I said, well, why couldn't you bloody knock like anybody else? Jonathan reacted in a typical Jonathan way. He put on his superior air, that he was better than anyone else who might be there. He huffed and puffed. Uh, he had a, a rational explanation for everything that he was doing. Jonathan Tokley Perry is arrested. His 10-year, multi-million dollar smuggling operation has finally caught up with him. But he cannot be charged with any smuggling offenses because his crimes were committed in Egypt. And to actually prosecute Jonathan in this country was not easy. The police are forced to charge him with the lesser crime of handling stolen property. Although he is eventually found guilty, authorities are troubled by the difficulty of bringing him to justice. As a result, new laws are enacted, giving police the power to charge smugglers in their country of residence. The case itself has redrawn the legal lines for the antiquities market, the antiquities trade, in not just this country, not just in the USA, but for the world. But to this day, Tokley Perry believes he did nothing wrong. I was immensely proud of what I was doing because having seen what was going on in Egypt, I was aware that if it weren't for people like me, a lot of those objects would be destroyed. I've no doubt that he justified his actions to himself through being the modern day Robin Hood, saving antiquities for the world. Despite what Jonathan would like to think of himself, he is and was a criminal. After serving three years of a six-year sentence, Jonathan Tokley Perry is released. He is currently working again as a restorer and is often consulted by police investigating the illegal antiquities trade.